Hey, it's Chris. How far are you willing to go in order to advance to the top of the jungle? No, literally speaking, in this game, Zubatus, what are you willing to negotiate, bluff, lie, or even wheel and deal in order to win the game? That's what it's bringing you from Bytewing Games. Let's talk about it and what you need to know and whether or not it's right for you. Let's do this. Who goest thou? That's what the original game, Quo Vetus, was representing. And this classic negotiation game is getting a refit, a retheme, and a slight reimagining. Here you can see I have the basic board set up in a mid-game situation on a three to five player side of the map. This game plays three to seven players with a heavy, heavy emphasis on negotiation, a little bit of wheeling and dealing, and even potentially some deal breaking. And so that's the biggest thing I'm going to tell you right at the beginning. This is going to be a very group dynamic game. Do you have the wherewithal and the table friends in order to play this game to its fullest extent? Because right now, if you have people that are willing to do that, this is what you're looking for because it plays like nothing else. Like I said, the concept is simple. Get your massive little animal meeples highest up on the star chain to the end of the board, have them in there, and then, well, you're gonna be resting on your laurels, trying to be the one with the most of them when this area fills up here for the end game scoring situation. But in order to participate in the end game scoring condition, you have to have one in here in the first place. If you can't get one up there, it doesn't matter how many of those other laurels you've got, you can't rest on them in that way. So how do you do that? There's only four basic actions that you need to know in this game. You're gonna be moving your creatures from one exhibit to another, relatively straightforward. You're going to have a zookeeper token that is going to be moving from path to path, covering up the laurels. We'll talk about that in a second. Thirdly, you can move one of the peacocks. Look, because they're bribable, because that goes into the last element of things. In order to do some of those actions, there has to be a space open and you have to have the majority of votes. We'll talk about that in a second as well. There are four main actions of this game that you need to know. It's relatively straightforward. You have animal meeples asymmetric with each unique powers that can be used twice, potentially, per game. You're going to be slowly adding these to the board, trying to move them up to the top in order to actually participate in endgame scoring. What you're gonna be doing as one action is taking one of these and placing it on an open spot at the very bottom of the board that you're gonna be moving up and progressing along. The second action is you're just gonna be moving them from one area to another area. Whoops, can't do that because look it, there's only one space there. So that's the other element when you're moving things. You have to have a space to go to and you have to have the votes in order to do so. You have to have the majority. Five spaces, I need three votes. Relatively simple, relatively straightforward. Next, you can be moving the zookeeper. The zookeeper allows you to pass for free without having to have enough votes. But you'll notice that he's the exact size that he covers up these little laurel tokens, which means when you pass in between them, you don't get those laurels. And like I said, those are your victory points. Is it worth it for you to be going up faster but not getting as much. Now, the last action that you're gonna be dealing with are these little peacock gentlemen. Peacocks are just wandering free agents, if you will. Mercenary to the highest bidder, because you can peruse them around different ways too. Now, you can't actually go down there, but you can go up and across, because you can also spend your laurels and bribe them. And so that's how you can get their vote in order to get the majority. Now. This wouldn't be a classic negotiation game if that was the only element of things that you can negotiate. Negotiation is free with all players, any players, at any time for anything that you feel like doing. The only caveat being that you have to honor the deal if it is done on the same turn. That's right. If you honor a deal that is done later, <laughs> well, that may behoove you or you can always break that because, well, you do what you got to do, right? So let's say I offer you two laurels for your vote this time, and I will give uh, you a favor three turns from now when it's your turn. I give you the two laurels on my turn, I'm required to do so. But when it comes back around, I'm not required to do that when it's your turn. So that is the negotiation. Now, how are you going to balance that in this game? Well, what happens is if you are one of the people voting to allow someone else to move, you get a victory point. And, you know, victory points, not meaningless. But again, you have to get enough up the board in order to get to the end game scoring here. If you don't have one of your meeples up here, all is for naught.
There are multiple pathways. There are multiple laurels and values that are gonna be available to you. There are even different values on here that will offer you things like moving the zookeeper for free, or you even have another one that the zookeeper's covering up right here that allows you to get one of your ability tokens back. Now, going back to that here, this is the other asymmetric thing that this game or this version of the game adds. You have an asymmetric animal that's going to have a unique action. And the different thing that we're used to in this game, as opposed to other games, is it cannot affect you, but it really almost plays a larger role in affecting those that you're trying to negotiate with in the first place, right? Like, for the example, the hyenas here, I can move the zookeeper before or after my action. I can move it for somebody else. Oh, how many laurels are you willing to give me for moving the zookeeper to allow you to advance and actually get up to the end game scoring position in the first place so you can even participate in the end game scoring? Ah, now you see the classic dilemma of what this game brings in the quid pro quo element of things. Yeah, I went there. Now you can see that there are seven different animals that are going to be available to you. And you have these nice handy dandy screens with both the animal side on one and then the information on the other, which is very nice. You can see the four actions and you can see all of the other animal abilities. So you're not having to try and remember them all up here, which is a nice refresher because how many laurels you have is not public information. It's secret. It's hidden, you're, and you're going to want to do so in order to keep the power position for your negotiations as you go along. Your powers easily tracked. As I mentioned, you have these little two tokens here, and all they do is they sit right on top of your little player board, and you can see here how well they stay. But that's what you're going to be doing, and that's going to be how you're going to be playing it so that people will know that information, but little else that's available to you in terms of what you can bargain with. How do we feel about things? Now, having played Zoo Vetus, I am not familiar with the original Quo Vetus whatsoever. So I am a big fan of a negotiation game. But like I said at the very beginning, this game is very, very, very group dependent. If you have a group that is going to play close to the vest and not being willing to compromise, this game is going to fall flat. This game will easily fall flat with you because like I said, the majority of the laurels that you're going to be getting on a turn-by-turn -turn basis are not going to be these threes that you're going to be getting off the board moving from one space to the other. They're the ones that you're going to be using to cast votes of your various number of meeples as you peruse up to the end game scoring position. And these will add up. Now, there are two sides of this map, a three, four, and five, and then a six and seven. This is probably one of the games I would demand that you play at least at a four or five player count. I'm not sure about the six and seven. I didn't play it at the six and seven, but I would worry that there is a little bit too much downtime as you're going around a little bit too much negotiation. You know, I'm going to burn the bridge and I'm going to burn your bridge. And you know, that sort of element of things. That's my worry. But the three to five, again, I probably wouldn't play it with the three as much. There's probably not as much dynamic in the three as there are in the four and the five, where you can have elements balancing out each other very nicely. So I'd say that is easily the sweet spot for this game, in my opinion. The other element that you really have to be aware of, as I said, you have all of these unique different animals, right? And these animals are different. Some of them are very straightforward. Some of them, like the hyena that I mentioned, is just, I get to move the zookeeper extra for free that instead of taking a normal action that it would normally cost. Now, if you look at the back here of this booklet, you can see very clearly here the amount of text that's needed to explain as you go down the various animal powers. And that's one, because of clarity's sake, but two, that's a lot of text as you go down. So the complexity of how they're gonna be used is not quite apparent at first. And it's going to take you a couple plays to really know how to optimize them. And like I mentioned, to be able to use them for other people's advantages to get you in a stronger bargaining position in the first place. For example, the Ibis gives you the ability to put an extra animal at a spot that otherwise was normally filled. So all of a sudden, this one's filled right here. Oh, but I can move him here because I bargained for five laurels to be able to use their power or for them use their power for me. How much of that dynamic are you going to like? How much of that is going to be cooperative in terms of, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, a la very political, very negotiation thematically incorporated. Very much so with another one like the rhino. The rhino 
allows you to take not only one from an area that it's in, but you can, when you move your own, assuming they can move, you can take somebody else with you, your own or anybody else's of your choice. And that's, again, where the power dynamic and the how much are you willing to give me to in order to behoove you, PAC, special interest groups, anybody, that's what this is incorporating only directly between the players and not a shadowy third party in the background manipulating all the workings. The armadillo tunnels, they don't need the majority of the vote. The crocodile can just move an extra space after they leave an exhibit and they can move again out of that exhibit in the next turn so they can move two and one. Those are the things you're dealing with. And so with any asymmetric game, you're gonna find characters or animals in this case that are more suited to your own personal play style. And the dynamic that's going to be there depending on if, especially if you play at the lower player counts of the ones that are present, but also the ones that are not present and how that's going to affect the dynamic as well. So pros, cons, how do I feel about this? This is the ultimate, your mileage may vary depending on your play group more than anything else. I will say that above all else. It's a very, very elegant game, but it's going to fall flat if you're not up for that. But if you know what you're getting into and you have a group that likes a little bit of that banter, a li likes a little bit of that back and forth without too much king making, but enough that, um, you know, I'm willing to scratch your back to scratch their back after you didn't scratch my back and they didn't, you know, alliances, uh, betrayals, those sorts of things. And I like the dynamic of you have to fulfill the obligation of this round, but future rounds, not so much. That's something I haven't really seen before. It gives it a little bit more weightiness without losing its brevity as well on a turn-by-turn -turn basis where you could get caught up in the minutia. And the fact that there's really only four actions really streamlines it as well. But like I said, one of the biggest cons I would fear is that at the six and seven player counts, if you're doing a lot of that, there's gonna be a lot to keep track of. There's gonna be a lot of this that you're gonna be trying to have to figure out because as you saw, there's a lot of, okay, when can I do this? Which one can do this? And which one is it again? I mean, it's on there, but there's a lot more going on up here. And that's why I'd feel a little bit more AP prone at the higher player count. If that doesn't scare you though, take this for what it is because it's very well done. Now I will say I'm not necessarily a fan of these meeples. I don't know if these are final product or what they're screen printed they give a nice um you know sort of a picture of the animal not so much the picture that i'm worried about but it's the size and the shape like i said with fox experiment that crowdfunding campaign i want a fox shaped meeple so with some of this it's a little bit more generic what they did here with the animal meeples though they did it i think more for a table presence but when i'm looking at these meeples um you know it gives you sort of an outline of the animal which is fine when you're viewing it from the side but the majority of the time as you're looking even from the camera here when you're playing it's more like this so you don't even get to see some of the actual aesthetic that's present especially if your table height up here and going down here so i'd say i wouldn't mind having them to be just a little bit smaller uh so they also don't feel so crowded on the map in the first place again minor minor trivial thing there but just something to think about because i also wouldn't mind actually having a play mat with these being downgraded a little bit, if I had to, you know, have a trade off there, if you will. Again, more of a luxification, an aesthetic feature. How do you feel about those in the first place? Your mileage may vary. I'll leave that up to you. So overall, what do I think? I mean, it's a race to the top, but you're doing a lot of negotiation as the genre and the game theme is going to make you feel like you're doing. And I really like the end game scoring condition where if you're not getting one up there, it doesn't matter how many you have on the board, how many you have spread throughout, how many laurels you gain in between, you're just not going to even get included. And that's an underutilized mechanic, especially for end game scoring. It's going to frustrate people who are doing really well, but then get outmaneuvered at the end. But I think that speaks to overall, not only playing very tactically, but having to play very strategically at the same time. And not a lot of games do that. But like I mentioned, if you aren't going to have people that are going to be willing to easily negotiate, because you really do get a benefit from negotiating with these extra victory points, the game may be a little slow, it may be a little long, or it could be going very fast, depending on how much of that is going on on a turn-by-turn, round-by-round -round basis, and how expensive people are willing to go in order to get their swing votes or bribes done 
each time. And that's where the element of repeated play is probably gonna make it more necessary in order for not necessarily a meta to evolve, but to give you a good semblance of when am I going to be willing to spend bigger and when not. And that timing is going to be very difficult in your first play or two. This is absolutely fantastic. The color scheme is awesome. The illustrations are top notch. I like the fact that they've got both the actions themselves as well as what everybody else's potential powers are so you're never having to be one of those game situations and looking it up and trying to remember it takes the ease of that and puts it right in front of you as well hiding your laurels so that your negotiation power doesn't uh, get lost at the same time this is one of those games where i enjoy the experience but i'm horrible at like i'm not good at when do i have to bribe when am i taking the necessarily the right action here or the right action there and so it always ends up me being like fourth or fifth out of a five player game, which is fine because it's still a really fun experience. So take that for what you will if you're looking for something like this. And you know what? I like the dynamic of putting these chips out there because not only is it going to influence which way you're going to go and how you want to get them, but it gives you a little bit of variety as well in terms of, okay, if I take this path versus this path, how many spots are open, how many spots are closed, which values are gonna be able to get there, what abilities am I gonna be able to gather, or is this just a shorter path than other people's? Which is more important to me? How is that dynamic balanced? And what strategy do you prefer? So there you go, Zoo Vetus, fantastic. Let me know if you have any thoughts, questions, or concerns on crowdfunding with Bitewing Games. Thanks for them sending me this copy so I can talk about it to you guys. Stay classy. Have a great day. See you around. Subscribe if you want. We're going for 7K right now. Woo!